pretty good cook. And I take great pride in the meals that I prepare after I've harvested a deer, an elk, salmon, or a brace of pheasants. It's part of the process. And it's also, how do I say it, probably the most respectful thing that you can do for that animal. I mean, why did you harvest the animal in the first place? In this episode of Fin and Fire with Jeff Mishler, I sit down with Hank Shaw. If you don't know who Hank Shaw is, you probably should, particularly if you like to cook fish and game. Fin and Fire is the West's leading retailer of your favorite outdoor brands. Fin and Fire is also the West Coast's largest dealer of Sitka gear, crispy boots, and mystery ranch packs. It is your 24-7 outdoor store. Go to finandfire.com and see what I'm talking about. Hank Shaw, thank you so much. I, I know that you're really busy right now, but for you to take time out of your day and your schedule to talk about cooking, uh, <laughs> for me is, I, I don't know, it's a compliment. So thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me on. Um, you know, I one of these things about hunting and fishing in general is that I've always felt like you give the animal the most respect when you serve your best meal following a hunt or a fishing trip. I mean, I always felt like if if I can prepare fish or game uh, and serve it to a friend and have them say, man, that is delicious. I have put a period or an exclamation point on that experience for me. And hopefully they understand a little bit about, you know, the importance of, 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 hunting and fishing in the, in the big picture, but also understand a little bit more about myself. But I want to ask you, how did you end up at this point of being kind of like the go-to guy when it comes to cooking, you know, fish and wild game? I don't know. It just kind of happened. Um, you know, I've been, you know, fishing and, and gathering wild plants and mushrooms since I was a toddler and uh, I have experience as a restaurant chef and, uh, you know, su- subsequent to that, I was a newspaper reporter for 18 years. So I've got this combination of professional experience, both in writing and in the kitchen that has given me the ability to kind of be able to do research, uh, in a way that, that maybe not everybody knows how to do and then translate that into very clear recipe writing. Because one of the things that's very important for me is that if I write a recipe that you read online or in one of my cookbooks, that what I write is what you read. Um, because especially with wild game and the things that you can't just go buy in the store, right? So if I'm, I'm telling you to do something out of your comfort zone with say, a, a, you know, an elk tenderloin, well, you don't get another chance at an elk tenderloin. So it better be right. So I've taken a lot of time to try and be, you know, in some, you know, one part Alton Brown, one part America's test kitchen and, you know, and, and one part, you know, hunter and angler, and uh, it served me well. I, that is for me one of the most humiliating things that could happen after a hunting or a fishing experience is to overcook the elk, the backstrap. I mean, if I overdo it and I don't serve it the way that I had in my mind, uh, it does not represent for me the full experience. I totally get that. Where it, you know. That's one of the hardest things to cook for me is elk backstrap because it's so lean and your window of opportunity is pretty narrow when it comes to, okay, it's time to you know take it off the heat or it's time to do this next step with it. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, but, but the one thing you always should remember with every facet of cooking, no matter what you do, is that you can always cook something more and, and people forget that people people will let things go over and with new proteins or new ingredients that they cook with because they think it's something similar to what they, they bought in the store and, and it just isn't. So when in doubt, always undercook something because you can never uncook something. Um, you can, you can make use of something that's overcooked, but not necessarily in the same way. Um, the window that you're talking about with something like uh, backstrap, is because there's no internal marbling and fat is an insulator. And when you lack the fat of say, you know, a prime steak, things can go south very quickly. I mean, you can go from 126 internal temperature to 136 in a matter of seconds. And you just kind of have to be aware of that and, and be just, be just, you know, <laughs> be aware of it and just That's like, cool. and just, and just use the force, you know? Yeah. It's <laughs> what you have to do. It's, you know, it's, there's no book that I've ever read that, that can undo the, um, 
so they can undo the steaks that my grandmother cooked or even my mother cooked when I was a kid. I would, you know, we would, we would kill an elk and then it would be just the color of my desk here when we would you eat killed it, it twice. <laughs> it was brutal. So that was my motivation, you know, um, for learning how to cook. I, I needed to find a better way because I love the taste of the wild game and I love to hunt and I love to fish, but man, I tell you, serving, um, a, a piece of tenderloin or a backstrap and having it be just, as you said, just seconds overcooked is really frustrating to me. I, I agree with you completely. You can always cook it a little bit more, but man, when it's overcooked, I, it, it is, I, if you ask my wife and kids, it's, they're like, it's okay, dad. I'm just like, no, well, no, it's not. You don't understand what I was trying to do. <laughs> so that I mean, said, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you, there's a, as long as it's not well done, then you're, you're, you're probably okay. Like I've, you know, even I go over medium rare to into medium sometimes if I'm, you know, distracted by something, but, but one really, really great, you know, prep tip for something like that is to salt the meat and take it out and put it on the counter for up to an hour because cooking room temperature meat is infinitely easier than cooking meat that comes right out of the refrigerator because you're dealing with that, that black and blue effect where, if you sear a piece of backstrap and it's cold, you can get the outside nice and seared and pretty, but the inside is still blue. And if you've let it sit salted on the counter for about an hour, even a half an hour, you go a long way to getting a better even temperature. And it, and you know, if you were to cook, say, a, a big piece of elk backstrap as opposed to steaks, you can just reverse sear that. So what I like to do is I'll I'll put the whole big chunk of backstrap with a probe thermometer in it in a smoker. And I'll set that probe thermometer to, you know, an internal temperature of about 125. And then, so then, it, you, you know, you're already, you're, you're good to go if you do it that way. And then you pull it out and then you just sear the crap out of it really hot and fast, just so you get color on the outside and then rest it. And then that's, it's a much, much safer way to go. And it's, it requires a lot less technical skill than to try and properly keep churning and moving and, 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 and jiggering with a, a big piece of uh, backstrap that has never been um, that has that has been not been internally cooked. Yeah, that's how I do it. I try to do it in large pieces because the way I like to serve it is to then cut the portions for the person, and you get a better yeah, sense of oh, it's just a much better sense of you know the meat itself when you when you do cut that portion and you look through there and it's like, Oh man, I did it perfectly. I mean, that's a really big sense of reward for me. <laughs> that's my payoff. Bison's kind of the, uh, bison's kind of the exception. Um, yeah, because, but you know, once you get to an animal as big as a moose or a bison, mm -hmm. you can actually do steaks the way that we know beef steaks. And, but I think anything less is, is, is better done the way that you're talking about. Yeah. I just, the reverse, process i have not gone down that path normally i'll just get my skillet really hot and it's a minute on each side when it's really hot and it's and it's a substantial backstrap say a piece of elk backstrap and so i'll go a minute sear sear on each side and then my trick is to take the skillet off the heat have that oven already at 375 and slide it in so the 375 oven and making sure that I rotate that meat like every minute or so until it reaches that internal temperature that I'm after. But I mean, you, I have to pay attention and there's a lot of variables there. Like how hot did the skillet get before I seared it? You know, how hot is it sitting in there in the oven? And you know, that's, that's the thing that I, I will pull my hair out over is, you know, is, is the outside overdone? And do I just have a little, you know, when I reach that temperature on the inside, most of the time it's just right. But man, when it comes out and it's not, I'm like, oh, I got to find a better way. So I am going to try that reverse process where you, you know, you cook it slowly up to temperature, take it out. Do you let it sit for a second after you pull it out and then sear, or do you just go right to the searing? Um, you can, you can actually, this, we used to do this in a restaurant is we'll hold some, we'll, we'll kind of par cook things, usually roasts. Mm -hmm. um, and then it can sit for an hour, just an hour. And then the searing process is the searing process. And if you sear it very hot and fast, there's not much carryover heat because you've let it do its thing already by sitting on the, on the counter. Mm -hmm. um, carryover heat's another thing that, that if you're going to cook a lot of big pieces of meat, it's, it's a good thing to understand. Mm -hmm. And, and also um, the whole juicing concept or the juicing aspect of the meat, if it hasn't had a chance to sit, 
it's you slice it too soon and it just runs out and and it feels like oh i just i just ruined that piece as well because it didn't retain the juices like it would have if i had let it sit for a little while so i try not to get in a hurry and i think this reverse process is going to keep me from getting antsy and feeling impatient and feeling like i've got to get this on the table for these people at some point pretty soon <laughs> it's just, just pour another bottle of wine and yeah be fine. <laughs> everybody relax a little bit it's gonna be here in a minute so you know I, that's that's how i would approach um like elk or venison and venison obviously we're dealing with uh you know smaller pieces do you do you do anything differently for elk versus deer um i mean not when it comes to backstrap yeah. they're pretty much the same uh the good thing about a larger animal is you often get different cuts that you're able to cut off the animal that you couldn't do with say a black tail or a white tail. Right. Um, you know, you, I can cut a, I can cut a flat iron steak off an elk shoulder, which it's difficult to cut a decent flat iron off a deer unless it's a big honker deer. Um, things like skirt steak, you can pull the skirt steak off the inside of the ribs of an elk that you can't really do with a, with a, a white tail. Um, cheeks, cheeks are another good example. You can, you can pull the cheeks off of the, the skull um, and you know, braised beef cheek is one of the great things in the world and, and braised elk cheeks is everybody's, every bit is good. And wow. again, like, unless you shoot 10 deer a year, which some people do, um, you gotta, you gotta aggregate a whole bunch of little teeny cheeks otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't even thought about the cheeks on an elk. I, I mean, I think I'm pretty good at getting all the meat off, but now I'm going to be digging for that. Cause it's like, a, I hope that when I leave an elk carcass, the coyotes are pissed. You know, that's what I really hope is that they hear, Oh dang, that guy was here last time. But obviously I'm leaving something behind with the elk cheeks. Yeah. I gotta think about that. Um, so, you know, making the transition from that red meat to say duck or goose, um, that is another, I have a lot of questions about duck and goose. I mean, I, I know how I do it, but if I had just say, I just gave you a mallard and, or two mallards, let's say it's a couple of nice big fat mallards and there's three or four of us here for dinner. And, and how do you approach you know, a fat plump mallard from just, you know, feathers on and everything to then getting it on the, on the table in front of people. I guess the first question is where did you shoot it? Okay. Let's say we were in Montana out over some wheat fields and it was a, it was a migratory bird that was coming in to feed on a flooded wheat field at night. Cool. Um, I asked that because there are big fat mallards in the Oregon coast that are vile. Um, and they've been eating dead salmon and I would skin them <laughs> and, and then you would use the meat in a stew. Uh, cause essentially a mallard in that condition is no different from a surf scouter. And it, so, yeah. So if you've got a fat mallard that's been eating something nice, um, you know, obviously I'm going to pluck the bird and so I'll pluck both birds. And if I've got two of them and you know, you could serve them whole, uh, I've done that. I do that from time to time. But the biggest problem with serving waterfowl whole is that there is no real way to use any kind of chef's magic or the force or, or anything like that to get over the fact that the breast meat is best served at about 140 degrees and the, and the leg meat and the wing meat is best served about 165 to 180. Mm. And the difference between the way the breast is best and the legs and wings are best is an order of magnitude larger than the difference between that on a chicken. So you can roast a whole chicken and you can pull it off by getting a kind of happy medium between where the breast is and where the legs are, but you can't really do that with waterfowl. And so many times I will, I'll do one of two things. If it's a, if it's a little bird, like a teal, sure. I'm going to roast the whole thing and it'll be fine. But if it's something as big as a mallard, I'm probably going to break it down. And I'm probably going to cook the legs and the wings as one dish, uh, probably with some sort of a stock made from the carcass. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to sear the breasts basically like a steak. Mm. And that's where I go. I go right to the breasts thinking that I'm going to deal with these legs and wings later. Um, they make great smoking material too, cause they're fattier. You know, they have, there's a little more, you know, fat like in them. And that's, I don't know, they just seem to do better on the, in the smoker. But that breast meat, um, I kind of treat it like a steak as well. Um, someone suggested once that I actually kind of pound it flat. You know, you pound it flat and 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 then treat it like a, a, a just a, a steak and marinate it or soak it and then do the same same searing process. But I don't do that anymore. I I literally 
breast them out. Do you leave the skin side on? Oh yeah. 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 That's where all the good fat is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So sure. I mean the, the, the schnitzel or cutlet technique with a pounded breast is perfectly good for an off duck, you know, something that you would have skinned. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like a, you know, an Oregon coast widgeon or something like that. Yes. And, and so that's great. That's a good, that's a, you can basically make chicken fried steak with them and it's really good, but I wouldn't do that with a nice mallard because you, mm-hmm. the skin is the skin and fat provides almost all of the character in any, in any kind of animal. So if you've got something prized like that, you enjoy it. So I want to ask you a question. I started using orange juice to kind of glaze the pan with, and have you done that? Like added orange flavoring to mallard and, and using, you know, creating a sauce from the pan after you've done that orange juice and then some other add-ons and then use that to kind of drizzle on whatever else you're making with it and the meat. I, I just, for some reason, I recently just found that orange juice is like a great way to, you know, <laughs> to kind of glaze a pan and, and, and add another aspect to it. It's something about that kind of sweet orangey flavor that goes with it. So, you know, obviously, you know, duck orange is, it's not a new meal, but um, have you played with that with, with, uh, with like say a mallard or something that's nice and fat and juicy and leaves lots of stuff in the pan? Yeah, there are, there are two classic dishes that involve orange that, that you mentioned the one duck all orange, which is typically done with a, a whole bird, and that works mm-hmm. fine with a fat mallard. In that case, you 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 would roast that mallard whole. But there's an older dish from the early 1800s called duck duck bigarad, and there's a recipe for it on the website uh, on Hunter Angler Gardner Cook, and it's also in my Duck and Goose cookbook called Duck Bigarad, and that is a it's it's a much more basic stripped down version. Um, of seared duck breasts with a bitter orange sauce and uh, maybe a little splash of Grand Marnier. And yeah, it's just, it's a classic combination. There's a, there are um, Chinese duck recipes that involve tangerines and oranges too. Mm, that's delicious. That's just for something about that combination, something about that combination of orange and duck just is, is delicious. And, you know, with goose breasts, I mean, I don't know that I, the, the geese that I've killed are not nearly as fatty as a, as, as a mallard, but they do have fat. So if we go to a larger bird like a goose, are you going to breast the goose out and do the same thing? Or are you, how are you going to try to do the whole Christmas goose concept and put it in the oven hole? So the Christmas goose concept, I've figured out a way to do this. And this is all, this is in my cookbook, Duck, Duck, Goose. So if you're going to do a Christmas goose and you're going to try and do it, you can do it one of two ways. You can do it the old school European way, which is to cook the crap out of the goose. <laughs> and so the le- and everyone fights for the legs. Because <laughs> um, everything else is just like tar paper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the the, the breast is a, becomes a vehicle for gravy, um, and it's good. I mean, because it's a vehicle for good gravy, because you made probably a giblet gravy. That's fine. I mean, that's a perfectly good way to go. But the way I prefer, especially with a big Canada goose, um, I don't necessarily do this with specs. Um, with specs, are they're only seven pounds, so I kind of treat them like a big duck. Uh, but if if I've got a big honker, you know, twelve, thirteen pound. Canada goose. The trick to do it is, it, again, it has to be plucked, um, is you roast the goose at, at very high heat, you know, 425, 450. And you kind of keep an eye on how the breast is doing. And when the breast is, is rare, kind of medium rare, 130-ish, you take the whole goose out and you drop the temperature down to like 325, or 350. And while that oven is dropping in temperature, you carve the, the breasts off the carcass uh-huh. and you set them aside in a hotel pan or something like that. And then you put the goose back in the oven to roast because typically you're doing this over a, a huge array of root vegetables and the goose fat is bathing the root vegetables and no, it's all good. So basically what you're doing is you're pre-roasting the carcass to make soup the next day and you're getting the legs and the wings perfectly done. And so when it comes time to actually serve the Christmas goose, you pull the thing out of the oven and while it's resting, you sear the skin on the Canada goose breast sides uh, until that's nice and crispy. And the the interior of the meat's already basically cooked. And then you slice that very thin because one thing people forget about Canada geese is they can live to 31 years old. (laughs) And, And that's a really old bird. And so people are like, ah, oh, the breast is so tough. Well, damn, man, that bird's probably as old as you are. <laughs> right. And, and so just slice it real thin like a London broil or a roast beef, and you'll be happy. If you try to slice it in those quarter-inch slices that we typically do with duck, you may not be happy. You may be chewing a lot. Mm. But that's the mm. way to do it. That's a, mm-hmm. It's a great way to do a, a Christmas goose where you've got pink breast meat and fully cooked legs and wings. 
Yeah, I go back to the pounding technique on the goose. I, I have to just pound them out, and then I sear them lightly on the on the barbecues. But they're thin, and they're kind of you know, like I said, they're pounded out. And um, but I do a little marinade with it too, some sort of a coating. So I get these kind of they're all, it's not filleted breasts, but it's kind of like a strip of the breast that cooks quickly, so it doesn't have a chance to really get super tough that way. But I've only had a couple of geese that turned out really well like that. Most of the time, it's just tough. <laughs> I can't kind of get beyond the super tough part of that breast because um, I think it is an age thing. Uh, well, and pastrami there, is a really good option. Yeah, pastrami, um, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I make a goose pastrami that's really good. Um, another option is Chinese food where mm -hmm. you're cutting small slices. And a, a, another trick, if you're going to go the Chinese food route, and this would also work with something like fajitas, is you cut your strips of the goose breast and then you sprinkle it real real finely, not, not a ton, but just sprinkle it with a little bit of baking soda and oh, let that sit in the fridge for a few hours. And that will tenderize the meat pretty profoundly. Uh, and you'll, you'll recognize it when you eat it because uh, every one of us has eaten Chinese food where you've eaten a beef dish and there's a particular texture to it that's that's tender and kind of soft and you're, but it's different that's the baking soda in, in action huh and, and you sprinkle it on and then rinse it off when you're done or is it does it just bicarbonate just sit there uh you you shouldn't have enough to really see it uh after uh, it's been sitting for a while it will, it will but yeah you can rinse soaked, it off yeah. if you want because usually there's a, a kind of a marinade that you that you put in with any kind of chinese stir fry i got you i got you i, I hadn't thought of that um so the legs and the, and the wings themselves on the goose, if you are not going to do the Christmas goose thing, do you just set them inside and use them or cook them and prepare them in a different way? What, how would you, how would you then, you know, break down a goose if you weren't going to serve it on Christmas day? I separate wings from legs because the wings on a goose uh, are among the toughest things in the natural world. Uh, <laughs> So there's the one easy thing to do is take the drumettes, the, you know, the first digit of the wing mm -hmm. and, and brine it with some curing salt, you know, like you use for corned beef or, or smoked foods uh, and you brine that overnight and then smoke it hard, like smoke it for like four or five hours. So it's like kind of desiccated and super smoky mm -hmm. and use that in place of a ham hock when you're making beans. And it's a, it's a phenomenal use for, for goose wings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, cause beans take a long time to cook and so does that ham hock. And so it's basically a goose hock. Hmm. Uh, the legs, especially on Canada geese are unbelievably good as comb feet. Hmm. So you salt them down overnight and then you rinse that off and then dry them. And, and you can either vacuum seal them with some, some additional duck fat or goose fat uh, or butter if, if you don't have either of those. Hmm. And then, you can vac seal them and put them in, in steamy water. So not even simmering, but like steamy water, like 160, 180 degrees. And then let, let them sit there while you watch football all day, because it'll take <laughs> four or five hours. Um, you can, the traditional way would be to, to arrange them in a pan and put them in a, in, you know, like a 250 degree oven covered like all day until yeah. they're, they want to fall apart. And then the way you finish them is uh, I like to finish them under the broiler because okay. The, what happens to the skin on the legs is it gets very tender and very kind of gelatinous. Mm -hmm. So if you try to sear that in a pan, uh, oh, yeah. it sticks to the pan right. and you bad things mess. happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's you just get a mess. A mess. Yeah. So under the broiler works really well. So if you just kind of think of them as ribs? A little bit, yeah. 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 You think of those I, the, goose legs as ribs and kind yeah, of. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the shorthand, I always tell people if somebody's like, oh, man, how do you cook duck? I'm like, well, the, the, the breasts are steaks yep. and the legs are brisket. Okay. Okay. Oh, I was going to, you said something during the elk, uh, when you're talking about elk, I, the, um, the skirt steak itself, that's under the shoulder that kind of goes along the rib cage there. No. Uh, um, it's when you open up an elk and you, yeah. and you got the elk, mm -hmm. the, the skirt steak is a strip of meat on the inside of the ribs. So it's behind the shoulder. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's, it's behind the shoulder, but it, and it's, but it's on the rib cage. Correct. It's yes. Attached to the inside of the rib cage. Yes. Oh, like in the cavity? No. Yep, in the cavity. Oh, oh it's in the cavity. Oh, yeah, the that? flank is on the outside. Oh, the flank. Okay, so we're pulling the flank steak off, and I'm always considering: Do I make fajitas out of this, or because it's kind of, it's kind of, um, it's fibrous, 
and it's yeah, it means you didn't clean it enough. Um, oh yeah. So the so that the big piece, you know, the big flanky piece that's not really attached to the ribs is sort of the paunch. Um, yes. Okay. That piece. Yep. That whole piece is suadero in Mexico. Yes. And it's if you it's basically cooked in its own fat when it's beef, and it's one of the most amazing tacos ever. Okay. You can do that with an elk or a deer. But what I typically do is once you can cook it in its own deer fat or elk fat, and then I will take it out of that, of its own fat while it's still very hot. And, and then I'm going to serve it, you know, away from that fat, because the problem with deer and elk fat is as good as it can taste piping hot, it gets very waxy very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people think that deer or elk fat tastes bad. But what they're really reacting to isn't the flavor. They're reacting to mouthfeel when the fat gets cool because it, it, it coats your mouth in very much the same way that, that chocolate does. And that's, and that's the paunch meat that's just that's like that basic. Paunch meat, yeah. yeah. And then but in front of that under, yeah, that exactly. is flank. And then yes. the flank is, 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 if you trim it right, it is just pure meat. And it's not fibrous at all. It's got a very, uh, very specific grain to it. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, yeah, anybody who's cooked beef flank steak, it's the same thing. It's right. slightly smaller. Um, it just takes a little bit of time to, to clean out all the silver skin. And I, yeah, I tend to use all that silver skin in stock making. That makes perfect sense. Cause I mean, I don't, when I get to that point of the butchering process and if I have the whole shoulder back home, I get to that, I'm just kind of like, well, what are we going to do with this? It either goes to burger or something, but I know I've had, you know, great flank steak that has been, mar has been rolled, marinated, marinated, rolled, and then you cook it in a little roll on its oh, edges. Lot, that's a German thing. Yeah, I've cooked it like that. And it's it's delicious. And it also cooks very evenly that way because you're cooking basically the ends of that roll till it gets to the, you know, to the whatever, the medium rare, or the medium that you want. Um, and it's not a solid piece of meat. So it tends to kind of cook a little more evenly. I don't know. That's just my experience with that. But I've tried to recreate that with elk and I've failed every time. It may be too thick. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Elk, elk flank is pretty substantial. I, yeah. I tend to use it for fajitas. Okay. Okay. And you just got to get all that silver skin out and then and, and yes. treat it like, yeah. And that's probably what I'm not taking. Yeah. The time and then doing. you, then you marinate it and, and just sear the hell out of it on a very hot grill ah, for, okay. for not very long. And here's another tip. Like, remember we were talking about the back strap and yes. I was saying like, put the thing out on the counter for like an hour salted mm -hmm. with this cut of meat with like a skirt or a flank or anything thin, take it right out of the fridge because it's thin and you want either sear marks or grill marks. And if you had, if you've let that thin piece of meat come to room temperature, the center is going to be overcooked by the time you got a good sear or grill mark. That so you want that center sense. as ice cold as you can get when it hits the hot, hits the heat. And that way you have a better chance of having it remain pink inside and still have good grill or sear marks. That's that makes perfect sense because that's exactly what happens when I try to cook it. It's just like, well, it's I the outside looks great, but the inside is it's so tough and stringy and and but that would have to be yeah I get that I'm gonna do that if that, I'm if I kill a bull this year that's exactly what I'm gonna do because I don't know I just like using all the animal so I jumped back to the elk and and we're through the goose now um, I you know. I don't know if antelope is treated any differently. People say that, you know, antelope's gamey, but in my experience, that's just a result of someone shooting it in hot weather and not taking care of it. 100%. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you shoot an antelope in August and you, you better get the hide off and you better get that thing hanging as soon as you can, because it won't take long before it turns. Um, we were hunting in um, Eastern Montana and I mean, it's, it was freezing out. <laughs> it was November and you shoot that antelope and it's hanging in the barn uh, in a half an hour and it's frozen <laughs> in you know six hours. So that antelope was almost like it had gone directly to the meat locker, and it is delicious. I I absolutely love antelope. It's one of my favorite um, uh, game meats. But do you have um, a, in terms of its flavor and how to bring out the best in that? Do you do you have recommendations on how to approach an antelope differently than say a deer or an elk? I actually think the differences between the various species of deer, elk, moose, caribou, and pronghorn are, are overrated. Yeah. Um, can I taste the difference sometimes? And I'm a mm. professional and I, I think people, their mind gets in the way mm. you hear, Oh, it's sagey. And sometimes, sometimes it is. Uh, and I've never had one that was sagey in a bad way. 
then again, I like sage. Um, but typically they're all pretty neutral, kind of minerally. Um, you're not going to, and you're not going to really get a chance to dry age a pronghorn for, you know, a month unless you're very lucky, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's not a very big animal. So, mm -hmm. and it's that dry aging that, that takes away a lot of that minerality. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, people, I just had a questioner today on in social media. who was like, Hey man, I didn't see any pronghorn recipes in buck, buck moves. And that's my, that's my venison cookbook. Mm -hmm. And he's like, don't, why don't you have any? I'm like, well, cause antelope is the exact same thing as deer. Like it's a deer. there's zero reason that you can't substitute any antlered or horned animal for each other in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, when I think about the differences in the way duck tastes, uh, oh, whether well, ducks a, are omnivores. Yeah, that's the yeah, thing. Right. They, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, a, a great case of that is buffalo heads versus ruddy ducks. Yeah. So they're both, get put in the same bucket by duck hunters, but they shouldn't be because a ruddy duck, 80% of its diet are invertebrates. Mm -hmm. A or uh, I'm sorry, a buffle head, 80% yeah. of its diet is invertebrates. A ruddy duck, 80% of its diet is is vegetable matter. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge chance that those ruddy ducks are going to taste just like fat teal, which yes. they are where I live. And there's a huge chance that your buffle head is going to taste vile. So mm -hmm. like, yeah, ducks... Ducks, pigs, bears, yeah. um, those are probably the three most common omnivores that we hunt. So, you know, when you think about, uh, we're jumping ahead to ducks, but let's talk about ducks. Um, well, we kind of did talk about ducks. Uh, you know, when, when I'm thinking about a really tasty duck, it's sometimes a pintail is the best tasting duck. Absolutely. And, and, and I would say consistently the best tasting duck. Um, a widgeon, completely dependent upon where it's been killed. Um, like the widgeon, yeah. that I, you know, the widgeon that I shoot down here on the Oregon coast from, you know, the Tillamook Bay, I haven't really been impressed with them. Right. So I read a book called, uh, big December canvas backs by Worth Matthewson. Mm -hmm. And he talks about those widgeon and they eat sea lettuce. Mm -hmm. And so because they're eating sea lettuce, they're not going to get a lot of fat on them. And, and they're going to get that seaweed stink. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting though, is that I've never had a, a gross widgeon in California where I live. Um, I've had skinny vision, but I've never had one that's like, Oh, whoa, that's gross. Uh, but I have, but I, I always keep the Oregon coast as a, as kind of the asterisk to widgeon being <laughs> in general, a really mild tasting bird, because that's apparently that's the one place where they get gross. Um, gadwall are very variable. Pintails are not, mm -hmm. uh, green and blue teal are not very variable. They're, they're going to be pretty quality birds all the time. Speckle belly geese are quality all the time. Oh, they're delicious. Um, Wood ducks are quality all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, canvas backs, there's a whole population of them here in California that eat Baltic clams. Mm -hmm. And they're okay. I mean, I, you know, they're okay, but there's nothing, they are nothing like an inland canvas back, which in my opinion is the best duck in the world. Oh, the ones that I've had. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have a, you know, a couple days where they were here. <laughs> they were, they were where we were hunting and we shot some and I was blown away by how good they were. I, just delicious. But it's all diet, right? Because like Brant is a great example. So Pacific Brant eat eelgrass and they're amazing. And if you if you skin a Pacific Brant somewhere an angel dies, like they're that good. But Atlantic Brant <laughs> are horrific. <laughs> and it's all diet dependent. Uh, you are what you eat. Wow. wow. So yeah, the ducks, it, they, they enchant me uh, so much so that I, I, I love to hunt them. But oftentimes I go, I don't know how I'm going to cook this bird because last time I had it, it wasn't very good. So I I have new things to consider. Um, it's so, a ton of local knowledge that you need to know about the birds in your area. I mean, it's just yeah. ask people and then ask them why, because there's a lot of old wives tales. There's a lot of stuff that's just passed from one person to another that is just, that it's not based in reality. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it is, you know, they, they call them gag walls in the San Joaquin <laughs> Valley, south of Sacramento, where I live. Uh, because they don't, they eat natural forage and their innards smell like a bad grouse and they just, they get stinky butt and the same, the same birds, if they're hanging out north of the city in the rice fields are amazing. So there's a lot of birds like that. Ringneck ducks are like that. Uh, mallards are like that. And, and so you just kind of have to get a sense of, well, what, what are the good ducks where you are? I mean, I, I hunted ducks in the, in the, um, the, the Delta marshes in Manitoba and there 
the mallards they're skinny and they're okay but the bluebills and the canvas backs and the um and the ringnecks there were fat and sweet and there was nothing wrong about them they were, they were the better ducks in that area which is you wouldn't normally think that would be true with a bluebill hmm. yeah i i you know we have scop and ringnecks same thing. and same thing exactly yeah. the same thing and it's like i avoid them uh just because they're they're different and i probably don't know how to cook them so given the choice i would you know pass on those and let them come through and i do and, like ringnecks you know, yeah. ringnecks are almost never fishy they can be strong tasting but i i kind of like that they're just bluebills can be fishy so i i tend to skin about three quarters of my bluebills oh yeah those sometimes the skin doesn't come off very well on the on the scop and the ringnecks it's, it seems to be just <laughs> harder to get off so yeah golden eye are even worse like that oh you know what i'm talking about the um pheasant are i mean i spend a lot of time in the fall chasing pheasants i have, love my black lab she's just the greatest little bird dog she's four yeah she's four this year and and every year i spend um I don't know, as many weeks or as many days as I can in the fall, you know, chasing those ringnecks. And so I have kids and when I um, clean the pheasant and then break the pheasant down, I, I was looking at that breast meat once and I thought, well, I could make nuggets out of these. And so the way that I serve my pheasant now is to basically just breast them out, cube them up, and then make a little shake and bake out of them using a little concoction that I come up with that involves, you know, some almond flour and stuff like that, that has, you know, salt, pepper, garlic, and chili powder. And I do a little shake and then I just cook them until they're done, those little cubes in butter. And they're tender and they're in manageable sizes. And it isn't an entire breast that, like venison, can be overcooked and turned into something so tough that you're like, how do I proceed how do I, how do I eat this thing? So pheasants are, I'm really curious about your thoughts on pheasant because I, I just know that they're a, they're a strong bird and they, they it, I had, that's the only way I figured out how to, to cook the breast that, that anybody will eat it. And by strong, you mean physically strong? Yeah? Yes. Physically strong, not strong tasting, yeah. but the muscles and everything just, it gets so tough so quickly. They are really muscular birds. So mm -hmm. although I, oddly enough, um, I've actually shot every upland game bird in North America. Hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with their architecture and, and, and how they, how to cook them all. So I did that in prep for the, the my, um, uh, cookbook pheasant quail cottontail and pheasants are interesting in that they've got hatchet breast where, mm -hmm. where if you were to take a plucked and ready to eat blue grouse and put it right next to a pheasant you'd be shocked at how narrow the breast is on a pheasant versus a blue grouse. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the difference with a pheasant is because um, they spend a lot of time running. Mm -hmm. They, they run way more than any other bird except for a turkey. And Just ask my dog. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the way I work pheasants is I still pluck them. And it takes, it's, there's, it takes a little finesse to pluck upland birds, but it's not, it's not hard once you get the get used to it. I just did, I just did 12 ptarmigan and, and grouse just mm -hmm. two days ago. Um, so the thing about it is you really need to separate thighs and drumsticks on most upland birds. Maybe not some of the smaller grouse, but certainly uh, sage grouse and pheasants and definitely turkeys. Um, and even, even to some extent, some of the little quail, uh, scale quail are, are track stars too. So they get these sinews in them that anybody who's ever eaten a wild turkey leg will know, or even a pheasant drumstick that they, they will never cook down ever, 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 ever. You and can put it in a crock pot for 10 days and it's still going to be just. Sure. Because it's yeah. essentially bone. Yeah. Um, so the way to think about the way I think about pheasants is it's it's the breast it's the wings it's the thighs and it's the drumsticks and then the giblets i also eat, i eat the giblets as well um so you get all of those pieces off of pheasant and they're all really wonderful in their own way but you have to think about them in different ways because a pheasant looks like a chicken but if you cook it like a chicken you may you may be disappointed 
that said, there are a couple of tricks. If when we were talking about the Christmas goose, mm -hmm. if you want to do say a roast pheasant for your anniversary or for or Christmas or something like that, so it starts actually when you're when you're getting ready to pluck the bird. And again, you have to pluck these birds to, for them to be special. Um, you know, if you're going to roast a pheasant, it has to be plucked. So what you do is when you're ready to to cut the bird and it's already been plucked, is there's a trick where you take a knife and you put you you slice so let me back up for a second every every bird has a so-called knee that is really it's kind of a square if you can imagine looking at the knee of a bird it's there's point 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 into in a square and that separates the top drumstick from the bottom leg and if you if you slice your your knife in between that square like right in the center of it what you do is you cut only only tendons you don't have to cut bone at all and so you cut about halfway through it and then you take the foot and you spin it around like three or four times. What that does is that binds up all those tendons. Uh -huh. And then with one hand, you hold on to the drumstick, kind of pinching the meat of the drumstick. Yeah. And then with the other hand, you yank it. So you, it, this is, it, it works about 70% of the time. Okay. So you spin that foot around and then you hold on for dear life and then you yank. And what happens is if you do it right, you will pull every single one of those tendons out of the drumstick. Ah. And, and that is step one. If you want to roast a pheasant and have it be something wonderful at the table. Number two is you should brine it hmm. because pheasant is prone to drying out. Hmm. And so virtually every chicken you buy in the supermarket has been brined, whether you know it or not. Hmm. It's, it's, it's how they, charge you more for less chicken because it, it increases water weight in the bird. And so if you buy a, a, a three pound chicken, it's really probably a 2.8 pound chicken that's been plumped up with salt water. Hmm. You should do the same thing with your pheasant because what it's going to do is when you roast it, it, that brining is going to allow it to retain more moisture as it roasts. So the, 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 the trifecta of a plucked bird, pull, pull those tendons and brine it. And you can have a really wonderful roast pheasant, just like it would be a chicken. But that's that's what you have to do. And you have brine recipes, obviously. In, uh, it's not really a real recipe. It's it's a quarter cup of kosher salt with a one quarter water. That's what I was wondering. That, that's all it is. <laughs> a quarter cup of salt. If you want to add okay. sugar, you can. But um, yeah. but you know, it's the the universal the uber brine is a quarter cup of kosher salt. And I and I say kosher because it's um it's a it's cut in a certain way. I use diamond crystal. Mm -hmm. um, to one quart of water and, and that will get you where you need to go. And, and I will brine overnight for a pheasant. And, and if you really want that crispy skin, this is, this is bonus tip. If you want that crispy skin, so you brine it on day one and then, you know, like the evening of day one, and then you wake up in the morning before you go to work and you take the bird out of the brine and you stick it on a plate uncovered in the refrigerator all day long while you're at work. And that dries out that skin so that it will crisp better. If you don't do that, you may not get crispy skin. I get it. Salt your friend. <laughs> Salt is, so your is dry friend. air. In dry air, yeah. <laughs> well, that's I again. I'm back down to the pheasants, just going. What am I going to do with the rest of this thing? And and I, you know, I think I saw Steve Rinella do that on one of his episodes with a duck. I think mm -hmm. he, a bird where he with the whole like tendon removal thing. I, I, I'm pretty sure I saw him like poke in there with a, his knife in around the knee. And then he grabbed the foot and gave it a pull and, and all the tendons are on the foot. So it's, a, yeah, it's an old trick. Um, I don't know if you remember field and stream back in the day. Uh, oh there yeah. Was a, there's a thing called taps tips. Oh, I, I was the biggest fan of taps tips. I mean, I, I am taps tips when it comes that to is, <laughs> that is one of taps tips wow. from like the early 1980s. Huh? I might even and, have, and I'm sure knife. he got it from somebody before him. I mean, it's yeah. an old technique. Oh yeah, I, I've I've pulled hooks out of people using taps tips. <laughs> they can they get gored and just like, okay, we're gonna use the monofilament trick now. Oh yeah, <laughs> here, hold on to this, or bite this, clink, and then it comes flying out. Well, let's move on a little bit. Um, so basically, you would treat upland birds similarly. Um, do you have? It yeah? sort of depends on the upland bird because there's light meat birds and dark meat birds. Yes. But any light meat upland bird, I would it it lives in the same galaxy as chicken. Yeah. You know, the one I struggle with is uh, ruffed grouse, believe it or not. I, I don't know what I do wrong with rough, with, with rough grouse, but I cannot make that rough grouse tender. 
And I don't know if it's That's just so I've never had a tough rough ground. Isn't that Shot weird? Hundreds. Yeah, and it's just me then. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> I'm doing that probably. Yeah. Well, I love to hunt them too. I mean, they're just I mean, you talk about a you know, rush at the flush, those things. Boy, I'm, you know, deer hunted since I was, you know, I could, I think 12 years old. And I can't tell you how many times I've stepped on one of those things. It's just, <laughs> I wish I had my shotgun. Um, so I, you know, we could go on and on about all the, um, uh, various upland birds. Uh, I, I think that, like you said, whether it's quail, pheasant, uh, the ones I, I hunt most of the time are, are quail, pheasant. The one thing I wanted to ask you before I moved on was uh, Hungarian partridge. So I have a friend who has a really good pointing dog and, I have discovered the joys of hunting over a really good pointing dog, particularly over Huns. And that is a delicious bird. I have not like mess. I don't think I've ever messed up a partridge. How do you, when you look at a Hun and you look at a part, do you just go, oh my God, this is going to be great. Or do you add the same finesse and, and, and technique that you would to say a pheasant that has all these other moving parts when it comes to breaking them down and, and choosing which part of the bird you're going to cook? I don't. I actually do treat them a little differently because they're small mm -hmm. and they tend to not be long lived. So I typically will just cook them either whole because they're small enough to cook whole uh, pretty successfully. And yeah, I do brine them mm -hmm. um, and do the one day, one day in the fridge dry out trick to get them really nice. Mm -hmm. um, but the, in general, they're, they're, they're not as uh, challenging you know, to, to cook as, as some of the others, they do have the sinews in their legs and you can do the sinew trick with them. And I do, but it's not as vital as, as with a pheasant. That's probably why I like them because they're easier. I mean, they are easier. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and my friends who hunt partridge are just like, Oh, they're delicious. And, and they are I just probably cause they're harder to screw up. Um, th there's so much, there's so much nuance in everything. Right. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's technique, but it's also just these little subtle things that you consider and you get a, you get a procedure or you get a program down when it comes to a particular, um, animal. And if you do it the same way, every time it, it, there's that, that exploration is, is gone. And so what's fascinating to me is to, you know, pick your brain on this and kind of broaden my horizon. The next time I have a bunch of uh, partridge laying on the, on the countertop or my next pheasant, um, Let's, I, you know, fish is, I do a lot of fishing. I, I think people know me as more of a fisherman than a hunter. And um, right now I'm out in the ocean chasing Chinook salmon and coho salmon with my ocean boat and um, bottom fish, you know, rock fish, ling cod. And so I have a, a, a freezer full now of salmon. And I also now have a freezer full of albacore tuna. So I want to make the transition from the, you know, the feathered and furred creatures to those with, you know, scales. And... <laughs> Um, I think, you know, Chinook, I, I don't know if we have, we often, my friends and I will say, well, what's the best, you know, salmon, what's the best tasting salmon. And that, and everybody will have their like, well, I love a spring Chinook first. And then I like a coho and I like a sockeye or a summer steelhead will fit in there somewhere. If you had to rank, you know, the, uh, the, the, the fish that you would like to prepare. If somebody said, what filet do you want? Which filet do you want? What would you choose? Am I choosing between the Pacific salmon? Yeah, I would say choose, yeah, between the Pacific salmon. Probably a white king. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I used to I used to fish commercially in Alaska mm -hmm. um, on a gill netter out of Juneau. And so I would see, I mean, I've seen tens of thousands of, of fish come over the rail. And in our fishery, we, um, we pressure bleed every single one of them. So I get to see mm -hmm. the insides of them and I clean them. I, they're cleaned on the boat. Mm -hmm. So I get to see kind of the a lot of fish and, and fat levels. And for me, salmon is all about fat mm -hmm. and, and all Pacific salmon are good in their own way. Um, provided they're silver bright, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, my salmon snobbery extends to like, <laughs> I, I'm not going to eat a colored up fish. Ever. I, get, I totally get it. <laughs> yeah. um, but other than that, all five species are good in their own way, but the l most lush are always going to be the Kings. And, the problem with some of the other ones is sockeyes are my second favorite. Mm -hmm. And in some ways they're, they're more interesting to cook because they have an almost equal fat content, but they hold it tighter. So you don't have that, you know, orange fat running down your chin, like you do with a good chink with a good King. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still very fatty. Mm -hmm. 
um, silvers to me, silvers are, are, I'll actually rank them fourth. I'll, I prefer a good bright chum over a, a silver any day because the, the problem with the silvers is their meat is much softer than all mm -hmm. the other salmon and their fat goes off much quicker. It has to do with their diet. They're much more of a fish eating salmon. Yeah. And, and I've had very fishy cohos and I've never had a fishy chum. And so, I mean, yeah, you can have good coho for sure. Absolutely. But it, that one for me, if, if I were to catch all three and I would cook that coho first because it's going to go off quickest. Interesting. My son was just up in Alaska with, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with a friend of his and his father hired an outfitter uh, to take them out. Uh, they were up in Ketchikan and they had caught all the, well, they caught Chinook, coho, chum, and a, uh, a sockeye pinks a, yeah and, uh, and a pink so they had a, a, a an array one night where they did a taste test with all of them and my son said dad the chum was the best and i had to take that with a grain of salt because i don't know who's doing the cooking right i don't know who's who's preparing this but his takeaway from that was better than the chinook and better than the coho and better than the sockeye that they caught and the and the pink was um was was the chum and honestly i i've avoided chum because to your point, by the time we get them here, they're striped. They're rarely bright. They're they're not. We call those fair. tiger brights. <laughs> yeah, right? it's not table fare. No, the thing about the silver bright chums are uh, they're clean tasting. Mm. They don't have that fat. And and to a lot of people, Pacific salmon are strong tasting because of that fat content. Mm. Now I seek it out, and probably you do too. Mm -hmm. But but regular humans who aren't used to if they're used to Atlantic salmon or they're used to trout, a chum or a pink is going to be much closer to what they actually want mm -hmm. than the, the more lush money species of, of silver, uh, silver red and, and, and Chinook. So if I gave you a nice big filet of uber fat spring Chinook, how would you set that up? Well, I'd give you the filet back and I would just take the belly and the collar. Okay. And, and I would grill the collar probably with, you know, a, a soy and mirin marinade and, and hit it with some sesame oil and ponzu sauce at the end. Um, grilled collar, grilled salmon collars are amazing. They're, it's because, the best. Again, because of that fat content. <laughs> I love them. And that belly, I'm either going to eat the belly raw and now I'm going to do it after freezing because I, yeah. I'm not a huge fan of salmon worms. Me neither. Um, or I'm going to smoke it. Uh, you know, smoked bellies are, are one of God's gifts and I have, I've had years where I've caught so much King salmon that I gave away all the fillets. All, all we ate were bellies and collars and the heads and the, and the spoon meat off the carcass. The cheeks, everything. I, I, yeah. you know, we have these big cleaning stations, particularly on the, at the mouth of the Columbia where, you know, the, the guide boats and the sport boats will come in and there will be a line of people waiting to clean their fish and you watch them clean those fish they cut the bellies off and they cut the heads off and they slide them down into the trash and then they walk away with their fillets. I'm like, that's the best part. I, it's insanity. I, I can't believe that no one has told them like that. You're, you're dumping the best part of the fish, the highest saw, fat content. Oh my God. It I kills saw me. them do that in the great lakes. We, I was same, same deal. I was with an outfitter in, in Wisconsin and I, I, I knew already, I'm not gonna let this guy touch my fish. And, yeah. but the guys I were with, they, they didn't want to deal with it. So they're like, oh yeah, go ahead and fillet them. And so my, I kept my fish. First of all, he he gave me a hard time for bleeding fish. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, well, you're crazy. I'm bleeding fish. I'm paying for this trotter. Sorry, use a hose. Yeah. Um, so I bled the fish and I gutted him on board, and which he thought was insane. <laughs> and and then he's not a chef. <laughs> well, he's not. He doesn't eat the fish. He can't eat the fish. Like it just you can't because yeah. like salmon is not is no different from bluefish on the east coast. If you don't, if you don't bleed and gut and ice your bluefish, you're crazy. No. Like it's, it's, it's cat food. And the same thing with salmon, yeah. they heat it up because they're, they're anxious animals. Anyway. So he, he filleted them and he, he did the same, he did exactly that. He started the fillet behind the collar yeah. and then cut off the belly. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part, dude. <laughs> I just, they, and my friends were pretty steamed. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, there's other ways like, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in Alaska and one way that they clean the fish, you know, the sockeye when they really come in is they, they jab right under the pectoral fins and they run their knife straight down and cut the belly off and the belly goes over the side and then they whack off the head and they fillet it. I was like, what are you doing with the bellies? Why, why are you, I mean, let's take those in and 
you know, marinate them in Yoshida's or something like that, you know, Yoshida's and, and throw them on the grill. I mean, let's eat them tonight because that's the best part. And I like, really, and the collars, man, just take the head and the collar, do this and, you know, get in there and snip that fin off and let's soak them in a little salt water to get the slime off. But then we'll do this marinade thing. We'll put them on the grill. And now there's not a fish that comes over that dock that they don't cut the bellies and the, and the, and the collars off of, but they had never thought of that before. And I can't, I mean, how many millions of sport caught fish, you know, the best part of the fish goes in the river. That tells me these guys never talked to an Alaska native. Oh, for sure. Cause they, oh, those are a gift. Those, those smoke bellies, you know, that's, they'll smoke them up and hand them out as, as gifts. And, and now, you know, they're aware of it, but yes, the, the, the locals in Alaska, that's, that's, that's the gold. <laughs> it's the gold standard of those smoked bellies. They're so good too. Mm. Mm -mm. Uh, so whitefish. Albacore. You wanted to talk about albacore. Yeah, I do. But you know, the other thing before I get to albacore is uh, we catch a lot of rockfish here and sure. lingcod and, you know, you know, my, my introduction to, uh, you know, like black rockfish um, uh, is that it's been cooked. Uh, it's been deep fried. You know, they, they you fillet it, chunk it, coat it in panko or something like that and then cook it in oil and you know that's still a really popular way and it's and it's still pretty tasty but it's it's not the way i like to eat fish i don't like to to fry fish so much just because i i don't like to mask the flavor of the fish i like to actually taste it so i'm kind of curious if you had you know a black rockfish there if it was just how would you where would you go with the rockfish well uh the cover of my latest cookbook um hook line and supper are two uh, canary rockfish done Chinese style mm. and they're, they're steamed whole and they're covered in kind of a, um, a, a hot chili oil. Interesting. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I eat, California has the greatest rock fishery in the world. Um, the highest limits and the biggest center of biodiversity. And so we eat a lot of rock fish in California, mm. a lot. And mm. so, Sure, you can make fish tacos, kind of like what you're talking about, and they are amazing. They're they're a really good fish taco, but you can do anything with the rockfish or lingcod that you can do with any other whitefish anywhere else in the world. And so you can butter poach it, you can grill it, you can, you know, you can sear it. I, I, a lot of cases. So if I get a big vermilion or you know a big or even a big black rockfish, sometimes mm -hmm. black rockfish get quite big. Um, you can take that skin on filet and again I, I skin and scale most of my fish um uh, it depends it, if they're real small sometimes you're going to leave them whole even and, and scale them that's the thing with rockfish so many people oh yeah well that'll make a taco i'm like sure it'll make a taco but if you keep that whole fish the fish whole and scale it and gut it and take the gills out and cook it you know, Asian style or, or grill it whole, you're going to get so much more enjoyment out of that fish because you're going to lose 50% of the edible yield off of a, a small rock fish. If you fillet it for sure. And it's just, uh, it just drives me batty because I grew up in New Jersey and, and porgies and black sea bass, you know, we would eat those fish whole all the time and across ethnic groups. And so, it's not just Asians. It's not just whatever. It's it. You know, everybody had a thing where you'd put porgies on the grill, or or you'd deep fry, you know, small snapper bluefish or whatever. And out here, I only see that. I really only see that with with Latin American communities and, and Asian communities. And it's a shame that kind of white people forgot that whole fish are good. Yeah, I think it's just a function too of abundance. It's like, yeah, we got 23 of these things and, you know, I don't want to cut, I don't want to gut that thing and scale it. And, you know, it's just, you know, maybe it's just the mindset. It's easier to cut that filet off and then throw the rest of the carcass away. Use it for crab bait or whatever. I, I don't know. I, I, I would like to know how to cook these things whole because my first experience eating whole whitefish was down in Mexico um, long ago when I was working on music videos for a fairly famous rock band. We went to this uh, restaurant that was out over this high mountain lake and they had a local whitefish there that was, it was like a, it was like a snapper, mm -hmm. um, uh, like a perch. It's kind of cross between a perch and, a, and this, I don't know, it was, it, was, it was something in between. I don't even know what it was, but they would, they would um, cook it whole, but the way they served it was you know, opened like open face. So they would mm -hmm. cook it whole and they would open face, take the bones out and you would have these two perfect, perfect, uh, fillets of cooked whitefish laid in with some mango salsa and some other, and it was, it was delicious. And I would love to learn how to do that because that was, 
that opened my eyes to how good whitefish could be. Yeah, that sounds like pescado zarandeado. Um, mm. And that's a very classic Mexican dish. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not hard. I think people get freaked out by fish bones. Um, mm -hmm. Pro tip, if you've got a, a, a whole fish or any fish on the bone, lift the meat on lift the meat off the fish towards the tail. Yep. If you lift towards the tail, the bones stay on the skeleton. If you lift towards the head, the bones come off the skeleton or in the piece of fish that you've lifted up. Mm. And I, I, my grandmother taught me that on rainbow trout too. As long as you haven't yep. cooked it too long, you know, you grab it from the head where you've, where the head was attached and just peel it back and all the bones stay attached to the vertebrae exactly. uh, and comes off. And then you have this awesome piece of, you know, rainbow trout that doesn't have any bones in it. So, uh, whitefish are the same way because they're, they're obviously a lot bonier than that rainbow trout is those, 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 uh, rib, that rib cage kind of flares out and extends mm -hmm. in more into the, more into the fish than say a trout does, but it, it comes off the same way. Yep. Oh, I'll have to try that. So it, when it comes to cooking it whole, are you steaming it or are you, how, how would you approach that? Day in and day out. Like I live in a hot place, so I'm going to grill it. Um, you know, it, I'm going to fire up the charcoal and I'm going to grill a whole fish over charcoal typically. Okay. Um, you, there's a really, really good um, Asian style. If you have a wok mm. uh, to fry a whole fish. Now this is, this is, you'll see like there's, especially some people will hate on Asian anglers. Be like, oh, why are you keeping the small fish? Well, they know what they're doing with them. They, they want a <laughs> plate sized fish yep. so that they can fry it whole in a wok. And so you try doing that with a five pound hard head, you know, it's just not going to work. Um, so, you know, think about in many cases, you're going to want to think about the end result when the fish comes over the rail. Mm -hmm. And so you look at this fish, like a great example are China rockfish. Mm -hmm. So China rockfish are the most coveted rockfish where I live. And because they're typically plate size and they have a very fine flake, they're almost like a walleye uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how fine the flake is. And they're phenomenal. They're really, really good fish and they typically come plate size. So whereas in other groups, people like they just want the big reds and mm -hmm. big reds are fine. Um, but they're, that's the filet. Right. Whereas the, the smaller fish, the whole point of keeping those smaller fish is to cook them whole because otherwise you waste too much. Now, on a side note, um, there are very few fish that make a better fish stock than rockfish. And you're using the carcass then for that? Yeah. Okay. All, the, no guts, no gills, but everything right. else. Right. And when you're cooking them whole, have you beheaded them? No. You leave, never do you, them. You're just gutting them and scaling them, cleaning them out with some whatever, fresh water or salt water, whatever. And then you're, exactly. okay. And that's good to know. Cause I, I mean, these There's are all a reason too. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, number one is it looks cooler. Uh, number yeah, two is it, it's, it separates the wheat from the chaff at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. um, so You're if you can't handle a whole eye. fish with a head, I, mean, I don't want to, I don't care. It's don't looking at me. <laughs> right. Like, sorry, deal with it. This is where your food comes from. Um, but you need to, the, you need to meet my kids. <laughs> I was, there. I was a kid and I ate, there's pictures of me as four years old eating a whole fish. Um, oh, me too. But my kids are like, I don't want to look at its eyes. <laughs> like, oh God, uh, it's food. Anyway, man. the Go mechanical <laughs> reason. Yeah. is because if you keep the head on that biggest thickest part of the fillet which is right behind the head doesn't dry out mm -hmm. so if you keep the head on even even if you take the head off when you bring it to your kids um cook it with a head on because otherwise that that front inch or so of the of the big thick part of the fillet is going to get dried out and gross mm -hmm. i totally get that it's the largest surface area that's exposed to heat too mm -hmm. right yeah so i mean that's why it dries out Huh. Yeah. I, I'm trying to avoid the whole deep fried thing. And, uh, it, you know, it's the, awesome. Uh, the, the canary rockfish here, I, it was like eight pounds. I don't know how I'd well, cook that's a that big whole. Canary. <laughs> I don't know how I would cook that thing whole. It was just no, like this. You cook a smaller one, you know, you, yeah. cook, you cook one about at eight, you know, 16 inches or something. Like you that. let that one go and catch and keep the smaller one. Yeah. If you got yeah. a descender, sure. Yeah, exactly. And you have to, and you know what? And, and maybe that's not the right thing to do is to let them go just cause you know, even with the descender, are you sure? It's gonna, I don't know. But so yes, now moving on to albacore, which is is prime time right now. And you you know obviously tuna fishing here on the Oregon coast, you have to have a, a decent vessel. And I don't recommend anyone go do it unless you have lots of ocean experience and a very reliable um, ocean boat. But um, we just came back with about four hundred and some pounds of albacore. And my go to approach for you know 
presenting or serving albacore is to serve it lightly seared after it's been marinated in some sort of a soy sesame garlic concoction. Uh, and the challenge with my challenge with albacore is even after I've seared it just lightly and it's completely raw in the middle, cutting it into perfect little portions to serve is difficult with albacore because it's so delicate. And someone was telling me that you need to sear it frozen. Does that make sense to you that it's frozen in the middle, you sear it on the outside, and then cut it as it's thawing so you can actually get a nice clean oh, cut? So you're trying and... to do that ahi tuna effect where it's seared on the outside but raw yeah. in the center? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't have to do it frozen, but I mean, you either have a dull knife or, um, or you could... seared it too much. It could be seared too much because I, I have so, very sharp knives, but it kind of gets crumbly if it's, you know what I mean? Just, it just kind of, it should it doesn't only make be a, yeah. like an eighth of an inch on the outside seared. Uh huh. Okay. Like that's it. It's really like you, you want to use a high smoke point oil, like, like rice bran oil or grapeseed oil, okay. something that has like a 500 degree smoke point and get mm. it close to oh. that smoke point, turn your fan all the way on and, and pat the fish dry and, and, the second it hits that heat, jiggle the pan. Okay. So it goes pss, jiggle. And what that does is it prevents it from gluing itself to the frying pan. Gotcha. And so then it just sits for a minute, if that. And then and then you rotate it. You rotate it and repeat that process. Um, and then you let it sit for a second or two on the cutting board. And then the only way that you can cut fish like this is you have a very long knife. So if you if you're a salmon fisherman, chances are you've got a really long fillet knife. Sure. That's the knife you want to use. And so you have you're not to cut sawing, like you're this. just going one stroke. You don't exactly do a lot. you yeah. draw it, you draw it back towards you. And if and and if you do that, it should be fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if if you're having trouble even with that, go for it. You do it ice, and then what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to leave it um kind of whole before you cut it for a good four or five minutes so that it's not ice cold in the center when you slice it. Right. You want right. it cool, but not ice cold. Like, right. cause I, I have seen people try that. And what happens is they get to the center of the piece of tuna and it's still ice. So their knife meets resistance and their fingers are, are, are touching the seared part. And it puts like big thumbprints in the, uh, I, yeah, I can see that in the tuna. It's so delicate. It's so delicious, but it's also incredibly delicate. And handling tuna for me has been an art form. Even breaking the fish down, I've learned. It's different. It's oh, you're yeah. getting four four quadrants rather than two fillets. Cutting it into loins. And, I, and I've just recently also realized how to take and carve out a substantial piece of the belly mm -hmm. without actually touching that lower quadrant loin. Because out there's that section that's just outside the rib cage that yes. actually is on the lower half of the fish that isn't even part of that lower loin. It sits, it sits in outside of, of in the front of it and it, and it goes all the way back to the vent. So, and that itself is the fattest, most amazing part of the fish. That tuna belly is, is now my favorite part. It, it, well, yeah, that I eat raw. Oh, it's amazing. And tuna is not really parasitized. So no. that's one you can eat raw without freezing. I feel very comfortable eating albacore just right there. And so next time I'm going to take a big old bottle of soy sauce and have some wasabi made up and, and, and we're going to, we're going to eat one right on the boat <laughs> right that we just made. And you know, home canned albacore is an Oregon tradition. So it is. And so I have a question regarding that. A guy was telling me the other day, he said, well, if your tuna was dry, you haven't let it sit long enough after it was canned. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you got to let it sit for a year or so. So it'll reabsorb all those oils because after you canned it, it forces <laughs> all the oil out. And then after a while, it soaks it all back up. And I'm like, I, I mean, he's not wrong, but a year's a bit much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't I mean, know. Yeah, a I... couple of weeks. Yes. But <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. He, he seemed to know what he's talking about. I just, no, I mean, he's, he's not wrong. He's just, he's got his time frame a little bit long. I nodded my head head and I was like mm -hmm, yeah that sounds great good I know the albacore doesn't last usually a year around here it's I uh <laughs> I mostly do sturgeon like that oh really you can it mm -hmm. same way I, as albacore okay well, do you have any other recommendations for you know like how you approach albacore uh, in general how to how to how to how does how to serve it differently say than a seared I mean you could eat it this uh, uh you know, sashimi style as well but yeah um, do you do you approach it differently Sure. The, the, if you're going to look for cultures that do really good things with tuna, um, look to look to Japan, uh, look to Mexico, and look to the Mediterranean. So the Spaniards, the Italians, the Greeks, the Turks, 
Uh, they all do really interesting things with tuna. Um, Japanese will, you know, you're going to get the, you're going to get kind of grilled bin over binchotan charcoal and you're going to get raw things. You're going to get lots of things like uh, agua chile or ceviche in Mexico. You're going to get grilled. So basically if you're running out of ideas for a fish that you have that's specialized like albacore or, or yellowtail or something like that, think about well who else eats it in the world mm. and and then you can you can use that as a guide to figuring out new and interesting ways to cook it yeah i will i will hank the hours they just fly by on these things every single one of these interviews that i do i i i, I get so involved and next thing you know it's over an hour so i want to thank you i you shared so much of yourself here and i really encourage everyone to check out your books uh tell me the titles of your books again so the ones that we talked about were um, in in kind of order was Buck Buck Moose, and that involves everything big game, kind of everything with horns or antlers. Then uh, Duck Duck Goose. I, you, I have I have a trend here with names. Yes. <laughs> uh, and Duck Duck Goose is, as you might imagine, is all about waterfowl. Mm-hmm. And and then pheasant quail cottontail is everything upland. So it's not just upland birds, but it's also rabbits and squirrels and things like that. That's the book where you're going to find all my, because I'm primarily a bird hunter. So you're going to find all my knowledge on all the upland birds and rabbits and squirrels and things there. And then the latest book that just came out uh, is Hook, Line, and Sopper. And that covers all things fish and seafood. Excellent. Well, we didn't cover rabbits and squirrels because I haven't made a habit of shooting rabbits and squirrels yet. Um, But if I do, I'll know where to go and exactly. get some interesting ideas. So thank you so much. And uh, this has been really a, 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 a great hour for me. Um, and as much as I love to cook, I always like to learn new things too. So it's, it's been great. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. If you want to know more about hunter, angler, gardener, cook, Hank Shaw, go to honest-food.net. You can see that Hank puts a lot of effort into products and presentation because this website is really nice. This episode of Fin and Fire with Jeff Mishler was brought to you by Fin and Fire, your local fly shop available 24-7. Go to finandfire.com to find your favorite outdoor brands.